Okie doke. So we are going to continue. Mendenbar has just met Simmering and they are about to get to know each other and maybe we'll find out why Kazool is not home. Okay. Uh, my official title now is Chief Cook and Librarian, so I've gotten out of the habit of being called Princess, said Simmering. Chief Cook and Librarian, Mendenbar said curiously. How did that happen? Well, Kazola and I decided on it between us after she became King of the Dragons last year, Simmering said. You see, the King of the Dragons doesn't usually have a princess, and we didn't want other dragons grumbling about Kazool breaking tradition. I was hoping it would discourage the knights a little bit, too. Oh? Well, it doesn't sound particularly noble and knightly to say you've rescued a chief cook and librarian, does it? And it has cut down on the number of interruptions. I used to get two or three nights a day, and now there's only about one a week. And the ones that do come up are at least smart enough to figure out that I am still a princess, even if the dragons call me chief cook. Doesn't that make them harder to get rid of? Not at all. The smart ones listen when I argue with them, and the stupid ones think I'm kidding. I had to offer to fight a couple of them myself before I could get them to go away. Mendenbar peered doubtfully at Simmering in the dim lantern light. She didn't look as if she were joking. You actually offered to fight a knight? Four of them, Simmering said, nodding. And a prince. It was the only way to convince them. She looked at Mendenbar uncertainly. I'm sorry if I behaved badly to you at first, but I really did think you were here to rescue me. It's the crown. She pointed to the circlet on his head. You wouldn't believe the trouble I've had with some of the princes. Being rude's the only way I've been able to get rid of them in a hurry. And sometimes even that doesn't work, especially if they're particularly stupid. I understand, Mendebar said without thinking. They sound like a lot of the princesses. Stubborn, witless, and... He stopped short in dismay. He'd forgotten for a moment that Simmerine was a princess too and hoped she wouldn't be insulted. Fortunately, Simmerine didn't seem insulted at all. She nodded. Exactly. That's why I send the knights and the princes to rescue other princesses. They most likely deserve each other. Of course, I do try to make sure that I send the nicest prince to the nicest princesses. They can't help it if they're silly. They had reached a side opening and Simmerine hesitated. Then she shrugged and went in. The kitchen's a bit of a mess today, she said over her shoulder. But even when it's messy, it's more comfortable for human-type people than the big caves where the dragons go to chat. I can make tea, too, if you'd like some. Before he could answer, Mendenbar emerged from the side tunnel into a large, well-lit cavern. An enormous black sto stove took up half of one wall, and the other walls were lined with tall wooden cupboards. A stone sink next to the door was filled out <clears throat> a stone sink next to the door was filled to the brim with scummy gray water, and the shelf next to it was overflowing with dirty dishes. In the middle of the floor stood a large wooden table and three mismatched chairs. Tea sounds good. Tea sounds good, Mendenbar said, politely ignoring the dishes. Simmering scowled at the sink and began rummaging through the cupboards. Do you mind having your tea in a wine glass? I know it's strange, but I'm afraid that all the cups are dirty. The sink has been plugged up for nearly a week, and I haven't been able to do the dishes. <clears throat> I don't mind, Mandenbar said, but you'll have to do something about the sink sooner or later, you know. I've tried, Simmering said in an irritated tone. Do you have any idea how hard it is to persuade a plumber to come and look at a dragon sink? I thought I'd finally found one, but he was supposed to get here yesterday. And he still hasn't shown up, so he's probably not coming. And there aren't any books on plumbing in Kazool's library, or I've fixed it myself. I'm sorry, Menembar said. Maybe I can do something about it? Go ahead, 
Simmerine replied. You can't make it worse than it already is. That didn't sound like much of a vote of confidence to Mendenbar. It didn't matter. He went over the sink, over to the sink and studied it for a moment, then backed up a pace and drew his sword. Simmerine made a startled noise. Your sword does plumbing? She said, sounding interested. I knew it was magic, but I thought it was for dragons. It does most things, Mendenbar said, absently working magic outside the enchanted forest sometimes took a lot of concentration. Quinted down the length of the blade at the sink, feeling the power within the sword tingle against his palm. Then he wiped, whipped the sword through the air, pushing power out of it to wrap around the sink. With a final flourish, he touched the tip of the sword to the surface of the scummy water. There was a spray of magic, a loud glug, and the water swirled and began to run down the drain. There, said Mendenbar, that should do it. We should, Simmerine said. Is your magic always so flashy? What do you mean? <laughs> Never mind. I'll wash some cups while the tea is boiling. Sit down while I get the kettle started. Mendenbar sat down at the table and frowned suddenly. Oh, bother. What? Morrowind gave me some cider to bring to the King Kazool, and I was so busy cleaning up after Zeminar that I forgot to pick it up before I left. I'm sorry. I'll have to send it with someone when I get back. Simmerine stopped short, holding the tea kettle suspended in midair. Seminar? Not the head wizard of the Society of Wizards? Yes, of course, Mendenbar said, a little surprised by her reaction. Then he recalled how much Seminar seemed to dislike Simmerine. Presumably, Simmerine felt the same way about Seminar. And you had to clean up after him? It figures, Simmerine muttered. She finished filling the kettle and put it on the stove, then went back to the sink and washed two cups, two saucers, and two spoons, with an intense concentration that made it obvious she was thinking about something else. Mendenbar was happy to let her think. He had a few things to mull over himself. Simmerine was not at all what he'd expected. She acted more like Morwen than a princess. He wondered whether she had come excuse me, he wondered where she had come from and how she had gotten captured by the dragons. He nearly asked, but pulled himself up short before the prince before the words left his mouth. He hadn't come to talk to a princess. No, indeed. When will cool King Kazool will be back? he insisted. Simmerine didn't answer at once. She set the teacups on the table, poured the hot water into the teapot to brew, and sat down across from Mendenbar. She studied him for a long minute, then gave a decisive nod. All right, she said, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know. A wave of irritation swept over Mendenbar. If Kuzul didn't tell you when she expected to be back, why didn't you say so at once? Oh, she told me, Simmerine said. She looked very sober. She was supposed to be home the day before yesterday. And she's not back yet? Simmerine nodded. And she hasn't sent a message or anything. She's disappeared. I was just getting ready to search for her when you showed up. So, friends, we have reached, that's the end of that chapter. What do you think has happened to Kazul? Why do you think she hasn't shown up? I'm gonna start a little bit of the next chapter and then um, we'll go on. Okay. Chapter six, in which Mendenbar and Simmerine have a long talk and Mendenbar reluctantly decides to embark on a journey. It's a long chapter title. Mendenbar took a deep breath. I think you'd better tell me everything you know about this, he said. When did Kazool leave, and where was she going? She left on Monday, Simmerine replied readily. She was going to visit her grandchildren in the northern part of the mountains. She does that whenever she gets a chance, and sometimes she stays a few extra days. But she always sent word before when she'd done that. She frowned worriedly. I, grandchildren? 
simmering smile. I know. I was taken aback when I found out about them, too. You just don't think of the king of the dragons as being a doting grandmother. But she is. In fact, I suspect she took longer than she had to about the negotiations with the forest giants up there, just so she'd have an excuse to stay a few more days. Anyway, she was planning on spending a couple of days with them, then to swing through the enchanted forest on her way home. She was coming to see me? Menembar asked, surprised. Not exactly, Simmerine hesitated. We heard that someone was going Dragon's Bane in one of the valleys on your border, and she wanted to see whether it was true. You can see why I'm worried. Growing Dragon's Bane? You mean deliberately planting it? There have always been a few patches here and there. The way I hear it, this was an entire valley full. Hardly accidental. Simmerine lifted the lid of the teapot and peered inside, then poured a cup for each of them. Kazul wanted to check for herself quickly before any of the younger dragons heard about it. Some of them are impulsive. She didn't want someone to tear off and try to burn down the enchanted forest with no more reason than a rumor. Oh, Lord. Mendenbar pushed his hair backward off his forehead and grimaced. I bet that's what happened. I wish she'd sent word to me. Simmerine studied her cup with unnecessary thoroughness. She was afraid that you were the one doing it. Me? Well, the king of the Enchanted Forest, you haven't been particularly friendly since she took over. You know, she frowned suddenly, what did you turn up today? And what do you mean, that's what happened? Don't tell me someone really has started a fire in the Enchanted Forest. Almost, Menembar said. He explained about the dead area and the dragon scales that he had found. Morwen said that they were all from the same dragon but they'd been enchanted to look like they came from several different dragons. I was hoping King Kazool would tell me which dragon they belonged to, and maybe let me ask a few questions. Let me look at them, Simmerine said. Mendenbar took the scales out of his pocket and spread them out on the table. Simmerine made a face. I can tell you whose scales they are, all right, but I'm afraid it won't help much. Warog isn't around anymore. Some of you had made that prediction that it was going to be Warog scales that were the ones that we found. You were right. It's a start, Menembar said. You're sure these are his? Very sure, but I'm afraid you won't be able to ask him any questions. Simmerine smiled as if of a joke. Why not? <laughs> because the reason Warog isn't around anymore is that he got turned into a toad about a year ago. Do you know about how the King of the Dragons is chosen? By a test, Mandenbar replied, a little puzzled by his question. When a king dies, the crown goes to whichever dragon can carry Colin Stone from the Fort of Whispering Snakes to the Vanishing Mountain. Yes, well, Warag poisoned the old King of the Dragons, and then he arranged for the Society of Wizards to rig the test so he could be the next king, Simmerine said matter-of-factly. It was mostly luck that we found out in time to stop them. And when we did, Warog turned into a toad because of his undragon-like behavior. She sipped her tea. I think a snake ate him, she added thoughtfully. There were so many things that Mendenbar wanted to say in response to this disturbing summary that for a moment he couldn't say anything at all. He took a large swallow of tea, which gave him an extra minute to think. Is that why the wizards have been banned from the Mountains of Mourning? He managed at last. Of course, Simmerine answered. Because we couldn't do anything more. Even though we knew it was all their idea, it was Warog who actually poisoned the king. Didn't Morwen tell you about it? She was there. No, Mendenbar said. It didn't come up. He shook his head. No wonder Zeminar didn't want to talk about why the dragons didn't want the wizards in the mountains anymore. Simmerine nodded. The wizards don't talk about it because their scheme didn't work out, and the dragons don't talk about it because the wizards came so close that the dragons are embarrassed to admit it. And Morrowind's too discreet to spread the story about when the dragons would rather she didn't. I see. Mendenbar saw considerably more than that. 
The disagreement between the dragons and the Society of Wizards was not a minor matter, as Zeminar had let him believe. And Kazul's princess, or rather, chief cook and librarian, he reminded himself, was nothing like the sneaky, manipulative girl that Zeminar had hinted she was. It looked very much as if Zeminar had been deliberately trying to cause trouble between Mendenbar and the dragons, or at least to get Mendenbar off to a bad start with the king. He wondered what Zeminar would have said about Morwen if her name had come up. It wouldn't surprise me if the Society of Wizards is behind this too, Simmerine said, waving her hand at the scales. It's exactly the kind of twisted scheme that they would come up with. It's possible, Mendenbar acknowledged. But why would they want to bring the Enchanted Forest into their argument with the dragons? Maybe they think you'll clean the dragons out of the mountains, or at least reduce their numbers enough that the wizards won't be able to come back without getting will be able to come through without getting eaten. Mendenbar shook his head. If it came to a fight to the Enchanted Forest and the Mountains of Morning, we would be very evenly matched. A war would cut the wizards off from both places, as long as there was any fighting. And it would probably drag on for ages. Seminar must know that. He'd have to have an awfully good reason to start something like that. Maybe he does. Maybe, but I can't think of what it could be. Can you? And that's where we're going to stop for now. With the mystery of what the reason for why the wizards are causing so much trouble is up for question. <laughs>